Basham. I work at the Connecticut Green Bank. Um, the Connecticut Green Bank is a quasi-public state agency, um, and we're charged with helping the state meet our um, our clean energy our clean energy goals. And um, we are, we've taken many different names and different functions over the years, but in 2012 we became the nation's first full-scale green bank. So we're we're taking limited public funds and we're leveraging that to attract private capital into Connecticut's clean energy market. Um, and um, we've been successful at mobilizing a billion dollars in investment into the clean energy economy. And um, we're very proud of the programs that we've been able to do across all the sectors. But um, with that success, we've really come to focus in on how to reduce energy burdens for our our residents and our businesses. So um, the energy burden or the, the cost that um, energy burdens our, our homeowners and businesses is a, is a big issue in Connecticut. We have um, the nation's second highest electricity rates, so that can really crush our homeowners, um, especially our low and moderate income homeowners. Um, so these are just some stats about um, you know how we have um, leverage these funds and our mission to really bring down the cost of clean energy um, to make it more accessible and affordable for, for people to participate in the clean energy economy. Um, so today I'm here to talk about you know our low to moderate income strategy. Um, our flagship program at the Connecticut Green Bank is administering Connecticut's state incentives for residential solar. So that's our, our residential solar investment program. Um, and we have um, incentivized 32,000 projects to date through the residential solar investment program, which is really great um, since 2012. Um, in 2014, we worked with the University of Connecticut to really evaluate the distribution of our incentives across the state. And essentially that study showed us that you know, we, we didn't really have an equitable distribution of our incentives. So that really kicked off, you know, the Green Bank strategy for, for addressing um, underserved communities. Um, and our strategy uh, is really two-pronged. It was creating an elevated incentive for um, renewable, um, for, for a residential solar, as well as a financing opportunity for um, for our contractors. So um, the elevated incentive that we have is a performance-based incentive. So it's uh, it's available for leased or hard purchase agreements only. It's not available for, um, for, for homeowner purchase systems. And um, today we want to talk about how the Green Bank views um, supporting um, the lease model and in particular a program called Solar for All. Um, and that's really the flagship of our strategy for addressing low to moderate income homeowners. So the, the elevated incentive, which we, we kicked off in 2015, some of the key components of, of supporting a lease over um, a, a purchase option was that the lease was only available for homeowners that are at 100% or below of area median income. So they have to income qualify to be able to get this elevated incentive. Um, the lease terms cannot be non-escalating, so those payments must be fixed over the term of that lease. And um, it needs to pass kind of an in-home energy burden model that we, we created, just really ropes in a lot of different factors for a household's income, as well as the specifics of the lease term that that um, solar company is, is would be offering. So with those three kind of, um, parameters in mind, uh, we really wanted to support leases for our LMI community. Um, and in our perspective, we feel like the low income population doesn't have the tax burden to fully take advantage of the federal tax credit. Um, so the economics don't quite work in, in, our, um, in our industry for the, the pricing that we're seeing for, for homeowner purchases. Um, and the second piece of it is our, our low moderate income homeowners um, aren't qualifying, credit qualifying for financing to, to purchase the system. So that's why we, we leaned on um, promoting leases, but we 
um, you know, we want to continue to look at how to how to um, also promote homeowner options for our homeowner purchases um, as well. So. Um, th those are kind of two reasons, and then also we've noticed that our homeowners are really reluctant to take on additional debt for their kind of most valuable asset, which is their home. And it's also really important for these homeowners to be able to lock in a fixed, non-escalating cost over you know 20 years, which is the typical term of a lease. And um, that predictability is important for for their home home costs. Um, so with, with that, um, the elevated, elevated incentive program, uh, contractors had to apply and submit a lease that we would review and go through the energy burden model and approve to be able to access this elevated incentive. Um, and since 2015, two contractors have, um, have been approved. One of them is Sunrun and the other one is Posigen Solar. Um, and they can then offer it's about three times higher of an incentive than our, our market rate incentive. Um, and then the other piece of our low to moderate income strategy is a financing opportunity um, that Posigen actually um, won through an RFQ. And that created a $45 million fund, which the Green Bank um, provided an initial investment of $5 million. And that really um, sparked the Solar for All program, which I'll go into. The, the product that Posigen offers, it takes advantage of the elevated incentive, but with the lease fund, they are offering a non-escalating solar lease and an energy efficiency services agreement. So they're pairing energy efficiency with solar um, for homeowners. And um, they're including, well, all all projects that receive an incentive from the Connecticut Green Bank have to do a home energy audit, which is a program that in Connecticut is administered through our utilities, um, but Positive is offering, and through the Solar for All program, kind of deeper measures with an, with an optional additional um, services agreement. Um, and what makes their product appropriate for um, the low to moderate income community is that they are using alternative underwriting mechanisms. So they're not pulling credit scores and they're not requiring a minimum income. So right off the bat, their, um, their eligibility for customers is much higher. A lot of their customers are homeowners that have looked at going solar before, have even applied through different companies and been denied for various reasons. They look at the risk of the customer through their ability to pay back those lease um, those, those lease payments as opposed to kind of the traditional underwriting mechanisms of, of your kind of traditional solar offerings. Um, and then the, the other key component that distinguishes the Solar for All program is that they're using like a grassroots approach for community marketing. So um, some folks might be familiar with Solarize. It's similar to that, but they're really creating community partnerships that go above and beyond and trying to tap into the channels, um, kind of the non-traditional channels um, into the community. And that's a really big key piece to, to how um, the model isn't just opening up accessibility for homeowners, but also um, getting out there and letting folks know about the options and giving them the information. So um, that kind of in a nutshell, describes how um, the Green Bank has supported, you know, the, the Green Bank's low to moderate income strategy through an elevated incentive opportunity, as well as our, our Solar for All program, which is a partnership with PogGen. So what that looks like, this, um, the Solar for All offering, as I mentioned, is we're, we're looking at reducing the energy burden for homeowners. So. In Connecticut, we do an energy affordability study. We see that anything over 6% of a household's income that's dedicated for their energy costs is a burden, is a high burden. So um, we're really looking at with the Solar for All program, pairing the, the lease product, which is a below market rate offering. Their, their monthly lease costs would vary between $60 to about $110, depending on the system size. 
Posigen reduces their system size costs by streamlining their engineering and supply costs by offering kind of three set system sizes. So they're not like, uh, you know, very customized. They're, um, you know, a five, seven, nine kilowatt system. That's helping the homeowner reduce and get more of a moderate energy burden. And then they're pairing that with the energy efficiency. And that energy efficiency is um, just a baseline of being able to do an energy audit and offer um, the, the rebate um, programs through the utilities, but also um, an additional energy services agreement, which brings that, that energy burden further down to a more reasonable cost for homeowners. And just to walk through that um, a little bit more, um, with, with the ESA, we're essentially, for $10 a month more, we're essentially financing that energy efficiency work um, over the 20 year term up front. So a case study here to look at a real customer, how does this you know, work out in the field? This is um, an actual customer, Saul Amazon, he lives in Bridgeport. Um, he uh, went solar with Posigen. He got a six kilowatt system and did the energy efficiency services agreement for an additional ten dollars a month. Um, the green bank incentive that he received was uh, about thirty five hundred dollars. So his monthly costs going solar is uh, seventy ninety nine for the solar plus the ten dollars a month for the ESA. Um, all of their system sizes are a twenty year lease. So over that 20 year lease, he's gonna be paying um, $21,500 and his lease payments and his $10 a month um, energy efficiency payments. Um, his uh, utility costs, his electric costs were usage was about 7,600 kilowatt hours a year. So his pre-solar electric costs for 20 years about $53,000. Um, and his post-solar electric costs are $32,000, and that's including what he's paying for his lease and his ESA. So in that first year, he's seeing $564 of savings, and over the 20 years, he's seeing $20,000 worth of savings. And that the savings is only factoring in the savings from his electric bill from solar production and not the energy efficiency savings that he's seeing. It's a little bit harder to put a number on and extrapolate over 20 years um, for, the, for the energy efficiency. So that's to say it's a little bit conservative um, for, for what Saul will be benefiting from going solar with the Solar for All program. So um, to, to give kind of a, an overview of the the Solar for All progress since we launched in 2015. Um, we've, we've signed um, 2,100 contracts, which has put about 14 megawatts of solar into Connecticut. 61% of contracts are low and moderate income, so they're receiving the elevated incentive. Those are income verified LMI homeowners, um, and that's 100% or below the area median income. And about 60% of the projects are just are living in census tracts are not income verified as as 80% below um, area median income. And I'd be happy to talk a little bit later about um, about getting LMI customers into the incentive program. Um, and I will note that the pricing that's offered to customers is not differentiated whether they're able to be income verified or not. So the support that we're Providing um, Posigen with the Solar for All product allows them to give affordable pricing for all so they can have solar for all. Um, so it doesn't differentiate depending on the, the homeowner's income or whether they can actually verify it with documentation. But I'd be happy to talk about that later if anyone's interested. Um, and as far as energy efficiency progress, 87% of households get um, the energy efficiency measures and 62%. Are, are opting to do the additional deeper measures with the energy services agreement, um, the $10 a month. And I'll say that as we've been doing this presentation, 
um, kind of over the years, that percentage has gone down in terms of who has done the, the energy efficiency measures. And that's because we're really starting to move beyond um, serving the market that is kind of left behind by traditional um, solar offerings. And we're starting to penetrate the market and get to households that are kind of uh, really difficult to, to serve. They might be encountering health and safety barriers where that prevent and limit the energy services, um, energy efficiency services that can be done in a home, in a home if there's mold or asbestos present. Um, and, and so in, in those cases, you know, they'll, they'll either kind of line item out that additional $10 a month if they're not able to provide their services that justify it. So um, just wanted to note that as well. It used to be in the 90s. So um, it's a, it's kind of a, a, a detractor of the success of the program as we kind of move through various um, housing stock um, in, in Connecticut. So um, all in all, this, pro this program has been very successful at reaching all of my customers. Um, and, and we've been happy to have been honored with uh, the Clean Energy States Alliance Slice Award or State Leaders um, in Clean Energy Award for the work that, that this program has done. And we've seen that the, the lease and the energy efficiency model together is really helping to serve um, this market segment. Are we, are we doing questions on is that, right? Are we for yeah. yeah. I'm just wondering, what are the examples of some things that you provide for energy savings, the ESA thing? Like, do you do installation or additional? Okay. Yep. Yeah. It's a blower door test. There's insulation, light bulbs, water aerators. Okay. It's, it's the whole gamut, and it's just kind of a, a laundry list that is customized based on what's what's available to do in the home. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over um, and save the rest of the questions um, for the end. Thank you. Great job. All right. Thank you, everyone. My name is Andrew Brighter Wu. I'm from Brighter Planet Properties. Uh, last name is the same as the company. Um, and our main mission is to provide solar access for all. So this presentation aligns very well with my daily activities. So um, we cover the entire country with a, a wide range of options. Uh -huh. and it's, it's kind of the bread and butter of our business. So uh, speaking from uh, our experience. So I'm going to lay out some of the problems. Uh, I used to work for Solar City, for Tesla, some of the bigger residential solar providers. And we had a number of problems where we were missing out on major market segments. We were covering these kind of perfect single family, probably didn't look like this, but I found it online, uh, households that had kind of the cookie cutter south facing, sometimes east west facing roofs great credit score, um, qualified for financing, or had, had a, kind of above uh, the minimum requirements for credit scores. And it's just a perfect household for solar. There are many of those households still available, but when we're focusing in that kind of early days of solar, this was the, the main focus. Uh, and we skipped that most moderate income household that just didn't qualify for credit, they might have a really poor condition for the roof and they didn't qualify for a car purchase agreement. And we just, we passed on it. We started to DQ and we moved on. But those people still want to take advantage of solar. They inquired about it early on. So that's one of the aspects of why I'm personally passionate about it. Um, you look at this, of course it is showing that there are more homeowners, but you look at it and we have a significant population of renters. I think the number I had was, uh, Over 100 million renters that are renting their boat or that are not able to take advantage of traditional single family uh, solar ownership or uh, lease options. So you have that major demographic of about a third of, of, of residences not able to take advantage of uh, solar. And then finally, you have solar inclusion. So if you look at the demographics of home ownership and this type of but if you look at the demographics, the green curve shows the portion of renters. And uh, oh, the majority of, kind of African American and Hispanic households, they delay home ownership uh, pretty far into kind of their mid-life mid, mid -life range, uh, their 30s, 40s range. 
And you, you look at it, and this population really shows that there's opportunity in the green for another option that can't necessarily take advantage of a home ownership solar option or you're putting solar on your own home. But what, what option can help that green curve of people? And um, that's kind of one of the other major problems that this industry has faced. And then qualifications. So I've been in this, this the mass market is where I kind of had found my, my roots in the solar industry six years ago. But um, you look at it, I mean, we've, I've come across some households that just the loss, I mean, it might be an over exaggeration, but um, there are those households that have shading that just create a high amount of moisture and the, the roof hasn't been replaced in decades. Um, you look at some beautiful houses that just aren't qualified with slate roofs, tree shading, um, and you know, of course you could trim back some of the trees, but still there, there's certain parts of this area that we've just built houses and forest. And then just poor, poorly shaped roof structures and then the multifamily, which I'm gonna get to, we, we can help. Uh, but typically, we haven't been able to help that kind of three-family household that you see in kind of the Mattapan, Dorchester area, Worcester, um, a lot of the kind of Springfield areas. There's a lot of multifamily households that just we haven't been able to help. Um, and then the electricity produced. So the the main solution that I'm proposing today, of course, there's many options, but to help this market segment that I've talked about is community solar. And community solar really helps to typically reduce uh, a given household rate payers uh, electric cost by about 10% of their monthly electric expenses. They're able to buy electricity credits that are produced from a solar garden offsite. So typically a garden that's, it could be a rooftop of a large industrial facility, it could be uh, a carport that's over a parking lot down the road. I, in Massachusetts, this has to be within the same utility uh, network, um, which is a, a pretty, if it's ever sourced, the entire ever sourced East market, it's national grid, all of national grid, um, but that's where the solar garden typically has to be located. And an energy rate payer is able to buy the electricity at a cheaper price from that solar garden, and they get unbuilt credits on their electric bill. And that's how they're able to leverage the savings of uh, solar garden produced nearby and avoid some of the cost of rising electric rates. Of course, they're still going to be rising the transmission. You're still paying to get the power to you, um, but you're able to leverage the abundant growth uh, that this market has had in community solar. Um, for me, we're, we're actively developing community solar projects throughout the, the market. So uh, we find this is a very important solution for that demographic that we can't typically help. And it, it, it's able to help uh, nonprofits that can't necessarily take advantage of the tax credits. You have the low to moderate income, small businesses that may not have the best credit rating and they might not have um, the tax liability to be able to fully monetize the federal tax credits, and homeowners that might not qualify. They might look like some of those homes that I, I discussed. And if you think of the market right now, there are a big focus on kind of single family households, and we're not really looking at a lot of these, these other entities. And for us, we want to provide solar access to all, meaning all, meaning everyone out there that pays an electric bill, that owns real estate, uh, to be able to monetize and leverage solar access. Right, sorry. I need to make things pretty a little bit bigger for me, sorry. <laughs> um, and then, as long as you own, own uh, or you pay an electric bill or you own real estate, you're able to leverage this option. Uh, so, one thing to consider when, when looking into community solar, uh, did you, you want to fix it? Okay. Well, one thing that you want to make sure of when like, looking into a community solar offering is how is the deal structured? You have a lot of companies out there and there's a lot of options for you. And there's certain red flags that you should, not red flags, but considerations that you should think of. And the overall offer, are they offering you a fixed discount? Is it, uh, 
does it increase at a 2.9% escalator, or is there a certain escalator in the rate? Um, what's the yield structure? So understanding what you're looking into, and um, that's one major factor. And then the contract type, fixed escalator upfront, and then the term. Pay as you go, a lot of people like to pay as you go since we live in a, a fairly flexible a lifestyle of kind of you might live in a given apartment for a few years and might move or you might be in your forever home. But regardless, it, you definitely want to consider the term. So you can have pay as you go one year, five years, 20 years or more. Um, the reason that the developers want you to have longer terms, typically when they first launch community solar, they want these 20, 25 year contracts is because that's their position on the solar project itself. They're, they, they're gonna own the project for the next 20, 25 years. So they wanna have that predictable energy consumer for the project. And it, the challenge is most renters aren't gonna be there or don't know if they're gonna be there for the next 20, 25 years. So they typically wanna pass on the cost of finding a new customer to you. So some contracts say, if you have to move or you have to cancel the contract in the next, say, five years of the 20 year contract, they're gonna ask you to either replace and find a new energy off taker or give them a three month window to pay, to allow us to find a new energy subscriber to the project. So that's part of the cancellation fees that they have in, uh, in some of the contracts. So keep an eye out for that. Um, I know this is kind of the un unsexy part of, of uh, the, the community solar, but it's important for you to understand um, what you're signing up for. And it is a great option. It's a great option to be able to leverage sa energy savings. Just make sure you, you, you know what you're signing up for and what you're buying. So we're in the Massachusetts market, and I thought it'd be appropriate to talk about the Massachusetts Smart Program. And the program allows for on-bill energy credits, which is exactly kind of what we talked about in the, whole, in the general structure for community solar. Um, you're able to produce the on-bill energy credits from solar gardens, and then energy subscribers can buy those energy credits and get that credit on their electric bill. Um, the SMART program allows you to also transfer those credits um, to different load zones, which gives more flexibility to where your solar garden is located to where you're currently buying your electricity. And I like it for those, the urban settings where we're in Boston, there's a high energy demand in the city. And you, you might be in kind of, not, not all the way out west, but in say Framingham or in uh, a, a more community, kind of less, less urban, still, still very populated, but a little bit less urban setting where the real estate might be cheaper for us to build a, a solar garden or there, there's not a huge development that we can't necessarily build solar canopy or carport on. So um, being able to use some of the cheaper real estate to lease and build a solar farm and sell cheaper electricity is definitely helpful. Um, and then the SMART incentivizes low income customers by um, crediting a per watt amount on an overall solar project, which what basically that means is the cost of energy that they're selling uh, the solar, the energy being produced by the solar system for, and has an additional uh, per kilowatt hour rate that we're able to just increase the financials of the overall development project. So it helps to uh, have those low income subscribers to better incentivize uh, for providing solar access for all. So a lot of our work in this market is finding those initial sites for solar development projects. That's where we we do a lot of our work and we work with a lot of key partners to find new subscribers for the solar development projects. So um, for us, we're looking at large landowners to lease land for our solar farms. And what we do is we essentially install it. We pay the property owners to use their space and we're able to have that solar garden provide to low income uh, energy subscribers. Um, the same applies to rooftops where um, this is actually a project that we did in uh, New Bedford where we're leasing the rooftop. It's a lower income uh, household or lower income uh, portfolio of properties. And this off takers aren't actually the, the tenants, they're uh, off-site uh, lower income uh, energy subscribers. 
but we were help, able to help the building owner by paying for the roof and replacing the, the roof with a new roof membrane. So they got the value of a new roof and the roof rent, and we're able to help the local community with providing uh, uh, community solar to help reduce their electric costs. So it was a win-win on both ends, and that's where I really feel the opportunity of uh, bringing community solar to all is helping both the property owners that just they own, own roofs and they, they have nothing to do with it and it, it, we can take on the liability of, uh, of all of their roof maintenance and repairs there's a benefit for them and then for the community solar we're able to help uh, the local community with providing cleaner cheaper electricity so there's a win-win and there's an argument as i'm kind of closing out uh out the presentation there's an argument with how how do we bring community solar effectively? And one aspect is do we have there's a high admin cost with just every individual person signing up for community solar. I mean you have paperwork, you have you know, the risk of people moving and canceling, but you have municipal aggregation that you can leverage of having an entire community come together and decide that everyone living in the community is purchasing cheaper community solar uh, from, from the town. And that's a more effective way to really scale the impact. Of course, there's a lot of red tape with doing so, but if you have a community that's fully on board and just wants to spread the savings throughout their entire uh, town, it makes sense to do a full community, community solar aggregation across uh, a city or town. Um, I, there's a lot of red tape to do that. So right now, we're kind of approaching it with that homeowner by homeowner, renter by renter, nonprofit by nonprofit, to uh, be able to spread the impact without as much red tape. But when you look at the big picture, it just makes more sense to produce, to purchase cheaper electricity on a citywide basis uh, for community solar. Um, I really appreciate your time. I, we're gonna have a Q&A after uh, our last presentation and then be able to go over and any questions. All right, everyone. Uh, so I'm gonna finish up and, and talk a little bit about the Massachusetts Solar Loan Program. Um, just to start with a little bit about MassCDC. So for those who don't know us, we're a quasi-state agency um, focused on growing the clean energy industry here in Massachusetts. We do that through a range of programs, uh, everywhere from clean energy investments in early stage and startup companies, workforce development, uh, innovation and industry support, and then uh, renewable energy generation, which is incentives and programs to actually uh, get clean energy technologies installed on the ground. Um, and, and that's the one that Mass Solar Loan falls in. Uh, just as a little bit of stage setting, uh, so you know, most people are familiar with this, but uh, Solar Massachusetts has been pretty amazing since the 2006. So uh, you can see over the, those 10 years, we've really increased dramatically, which is awesome. And uh, what we want to focus on is how those uh, numbers have or have not served certain populations, namely the low and moderate income sector. So, um, Master CDC runs a variety of programs that has uh, been focused on supporting this industry over the years, and um, we have kind of a range of efforts now that are looking at how can we particularly support the LMI community. Um, Mass Solar Alone is what I'm going to focus on. We also have our Acre program, which is a combined heat pump and solar uh, solution. And then the SMART program, uh, as Andrew mentioned, actually has a low income uh, adder component as well to help make solar more affordable for those markets. So the Mass Solar Loan Program, um, we were sparked by a 2013 study done by DOER that uh, demonstrated the greater value of directly owning your system. So this kind of, in, uh, the, the third solution to the other two that were mentioned is, um, if you can own your system and there's a way for, for you to do that, uh, that's how you're going to get the most value out of it. Um, these other solutions, leases and, and community solar, there's a third party in there that's going to be taking some of that cut. Um, but it's hard for low moderate income customers to do that. They either might not have the, the credit score or the available financing that they need. Uh, they may have trouble taking advantage of the tax credit, which is a pretty big piece of making those economics work out. And they just might not have the cash lying around for a $20,000, $30,000 investment up front. So, uh, the solar loan program was designed to provide a, a financing mechanism for that can kind of expand the market traditionally that traditionally has financing available um, and increase uh, you know access for these income qualified residents. Uh, 
Uh, so what this program ended up doing is we are partnered with 17 local banks and credit unions across the state um, and leveraging their capital um, and their expertise in underwriting personal consumer loans and bringing them into the solar market. Uh, and then we have a network of 100 plus installers and that's a, another kind of key piece of the program. We wanted this to be available to all installers, big and small, throughout the state um, to have an option for them to offer financing to their customers. Uh, the program was launched in December 2015, and, and just kind of as mentioned, is focused on connect, connecting um, consumers interested in purchasing their solar system with lenders offering a solar finance product. Um, lenders offer their kind of standard underwriting process. It's a kind of certain parameters we set on the loan. It's a fixed rate loan. There's a cap on interest rates, cap closing costs, um, and some of those things. We at NSEC offer three different types of loan support um, on top of that loan to help make it more available for low and moderate income customers, make it more available for various credit scores, uh, and just uh, make sure that this is an affordable financing option uh, for these customers. And then uh, from the start, this was always the intent, but over the course of the program, we've stepped our incentives down to allow this kind of market of financing options develop. Um, unsupported without our incentives in it and focused our incentives particularly on the low and moderate income communities that we uh, think need it more and need more support to be able to, to access solar. Um, briefly, just going into what those three support mechanisms are, we have income-based loan support, which is a direct reduction of the principal of the loan. It's 30% or 10% depending on your income level and part of the reasons we set those levels that they are is that lower incomes may have more and more difficulty accessing that federal tax credit, and so they need a little more support to offset that. Uh, we also have an interest rate buy-down where we reduce the interest rate on these loans currently by 1.5% so that um, the kind of cost of financing these systems is reduced for those lower income customers. And then finally, we have a loan loss reserve, which is based off of the credit score of the borrower. Uh, and we set aside funding for each lender that's offering a loan to those lower credit score customers uh, so that in the event of defaults, the lender has a little extra security on that pool. The intent being it lets lenders broaden the range of credit scores they normally would offer this type of loan to. And for the most part, these are unsecured or secured with a UCC1 uh, I don't the details. But um, so the, the having that support really increases the range of credit scores that these lenders are able to lend to. Uh, so getting to the results of what the program's done to date, uh, over 4,700 loans, which is pretty awesome. And the kind of particular thing there is over 2,300 of those have been what we call income qualified customers. So that's 120% uh, of median income or below. Uh, it's been 150 million in loan value that's been leveraged and 34, there about 35 million in, in loan support that we've awarded under the program. Uh, and I think the key piece of that is 74% of that funding has gone to these low moderate income customers that we're trying to support. Uh, 40 megawatts of solar. And just to kind of give a sense of what these typical projects look like, they're 30-ish thousand dollar loans and eight point something kilowatts. Uh, so just a little bit of a quick, very high level example so you can see how kind of this direct ownership model pencils out. This assumes that the person can take advantage of both the 30% principal reduction and that tax credit, which may or may not be the case in all cases, but for some people it will be. Um, but if you start with a, a $20,000 system and are able to take advantage of our income-based loan support, that tax credit, the state tax credit, you're getting down to somewhere around $7,000 that you're financing over a 10-year term. Um, our market average interest rate um, for that low-income grouping is 4.5% currently. Uh, and then running all that out and assuming kind of um, the standard smart revenue and some of those pieces, it's roughly $1,000 a year in savings uh, over the course of that term. Um, there's some little delays and stuff depending on when your incentives come through, taking advantage of the tax credit and stuff. But from the general uh, principle, because you're financing these systems, that's from year one-ish uh, of being able to take advantage. Uh, and then the other piece I just want to kind of touch on a little bit, because um, we think it's a, an important story of, of our program and, and uh, this kind of financing-based program, is how these loans perform to date. Um, generally, it's been very strong. Our default rate under the program has been 0.2% uh, on these nearly 4,500 loans. Still relatively early. I think we're an average of 17 or so months of seasoning uh, on these loans. but. Uh, it's still a great number to see. Uh, and I think the kind of more interesting piece is that, you know, 
are important are how it correlates to say our various income categories. And so you can actually see the percent of loans that have been 30 days late for that below 80% of income is 4.2%, and for the non-income qualified, it's actually 6%. So um, what we're kind of trying to tell is, is the story that uh, low-income people are not necessarily by that, that metric alone gonna be worse at paying these loans off. And I think that's important to bring that information to lenders because it's gonna help them expand who they can offer financing to uh, going forward. Um, the FICO is a better correlation, but I also caveat that that's relatively offset by the fact that we have a loan loss reserve, so lenders know they have support when they're lending to lower credit scores and may make loans to people that would normally kind of fall through their underwriting process. Um, it's kind of a, double-edged sword of wanting to expand that credit score range that's being looked at, but uh, also how it skews um, some of that data. Uh, so with that, we're going to move on to questions.